All right, guys. Hi, welcome. Um, today we are going to talk about something that's really scary, um, feeling alone and the fear of being alone, the fear of feeling like you're going to be alone forever. Um, that often goes along with separation or divorce. Um, so this fear, it's real, it's profound, it's terrifying for most people. Um, and I think it's a really important thing for us to acknowledge and to address. So what I'm going to talk about today are some really concrete things that you can do to make this uh, pain more tolerable, make the fear um, less overwhelming, and help you really get through it so that you don't have to keep feeling this way. Um, hi, Richard. It's really great to have you on the call. Um, Richard, as we're going and anyone else who's on, um, please feel free to drop any questions there in the chat. If there's something you'd like me to speak to specifically, I'm happy to do that. So please, um, this is our time, your time. I want to be here as a resource for you. So anything you want to know, please let me know. Um, so I, the first thing I want to just address is the intensity that um, fear and especially this fear of being alone and the fear that you're going to continue to be alone, right? that there won't ever be anybody else um, who really loves you or is there for you or supports you. I want to address how intense it feels because it can feel like a bit of a life or death experience. Like it can feel that intense and that painful. And I think it can be really helpful to recognize that this is a really primal fear for us as human beings. And you've probably heard me say this if you've watched any of my videos, but people just don't do well on their own historically, right? We don't have claws, we don't have fangs, we don't have fur, we die, except for our big brains and the fact that we have other people around us, right? So we evolved to live with other people, to live in relationship. And for much of human history to be separated from those relationships, especially the primary relationships, meant that you would probably die. Right? So it is for most of human history, these kinds of splits um, could be life and death. And so it still feels that way for us. It feels that intense when we find ourselves alone or afraid that we're going to continue to be alone. It can be a real panic inducing state. Um, Jean-Claude, I see you on. Hello. Welcome. Um, once again, please drop me any notes in the chat, guys. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear where you're from. If there's something specific you're going through right now, let me know and I'll speak to that as best I can or if you have any questions. Okay, so understanding that this fear is really primal doesn't change it, right? Uh, but it can help a little bit because it can give us a little bit of a distance. So we have this incredibly intense, incredibly frightening fear, right, of being alone, this and this concern that it's going to continue to be that way. And when we realize that some of the intensity of that is because for much of human history, being alone meant that we would die, we can take a step back and say, okay, am I safe right now? Is there food in my fridge? Am I warm? Right? Can I literally survive the night by myself? And what most of us who have the luxury of being here and watching a YouTube video will discover if we really ask that question is that I am okay right now. I'm safe. There's so no lions about to eat me. I'm not gonna freeze to death. I'm not gonna starve. And yes, what you're going through is so much more than that. And it hurts so much more than that. But that subtle awareness, that little bit of space that I'm not going to die today, being alone does not mean death. It did for my ancestors. It did for much of human history. It did when I was a child, but it does not equal death for me right now, today, tonight. That opens up this tiny little crack, this little bit of distance between the intensity of what you're feeling and you. And in that space, we start to have room to do some work. Okay, so guys, let's talk about concrete things. What do we do about the fear of being alone and about the fear of being alone forever? Connection is critically important. So I'd like you to just take a moment and think about the people in your life. And I want you to think about who you could call who would show up, whether it was the middle of the night, even if they were across the country, who do you know that you could call any time of day or night who would be there for you? See if you can come up with one person. If you can come up with more than one, that's wonderful. If you can't come up with anyone or you feel like there's just not enough people in your life that you can lean on, that you can support, let's call it your A team, the people that would really be there if you needed them today, then making that Making those connections a priority is the most important thing you can do for your mental and emotional health. 
It's that simple. When we feel alone, we need connection. Human nervous systems co-regulate. We feel stronger. We feel safer. We feel more resilient. We feel more capable when we feel connected. And connection can come in a lot of different forms, you guys. It does not have to be romantic love. It doesn't have to be someone of the opposite sex. It can be a friend, a child, a parent, a coworker, a therapist, a coach, um, a support group or a community you go to. It can be a connection with God. It can be a connection with nature. It can be connections with animals. But make sure that you are prioritizing connection if this is coming up for you. And in just a moment, we're going to talk about what to do if you don't feel like connection is really a possibility for you or you don't have options to find those connections. I want to just take a moment. I see a note in the chat from Jean-Claude from Quebec. Very nice. Thank you for being here. Recently separated after 25 years. I think my ex is quite BPD. She does not recognize that she has a mental health issue. This is actually a topic, Jean-Claude, that we should maybe do some videos around. A lot of my clients um, have spouses or ex-spouses with both diagnosed and undiagnosed mental health disorders. Um, BPD is a big one, borderline personality disorder. Bipolar disorder is another big one. Um, even, you know, really unmanaged, undiagnosed depression or anxiety can be huge contributors because all of those uh, mental health conditions cause people to disconnect in different ways. And so as you look back on that relationship, what you might notice is that there were a lot of places where she wasn't able um, to, to connect or stay connected. And that's, you know, so often, um, various mental health conditions, and this is especially well documented in bipolar disorder and quite a bit in BPD as well, is that, you know, so often they're a part of a response to trauma that someone suffered, um, in childhood or even before birth. And I should offer you the disclaimer, Jean-Claude, I am not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a life coach and a master NLP practitioner. So I am not in any way qualified to diagnose or speak directly to diagnoses. All I can do is tell you my experience and what I have seen. Um, and what I have seen consistently amongst my clients whose ex-partners have uh, a diagnosed mental health condition is that there's usually a pretty strong history of trauma. And the end result of it is that in one way or another, that person really struggles to feel connected to other people. And that's so much of what trauma does to us, right? Trauma isn't the thing that happens to you. It's the change that happens inside of you as a result of that thing. And that change is that it's hard to be in relationship. It's hard to feel connected and it's hard to feel safe when you feel connected because so often the trauma is, it's a, it's a damage of a relationship, right? It damages our ability to trust other people, to feel safe with other people. And that makes connection difficult which is actually an interesting segue back into the topic of this call, which is that fear of being alone and feeling alone during separation or divorce, because what you're going through in a separation or divorce is a form of relational trauma. Right? There's often broken trust. There's a sense of betrayal. There's um, pain, wounds inflicted, both mental and emotional, but also perhaps in terms of custody or finances or your physical living situation. So your ability to feel connected can be directly impacted by the experience of a separation or a divorce. And this is really important to pay attention to because what I just told you a few moments ago is that it's really important to get connected, right? If you're feeling alone, connection is going to be the, the best thing for your nervous system. But how do you feel connected when you've been through this trauma that's left it really difficult for you to feel safe in a relationship, right? So this is the, the challenge that we face when we go through something like a separation or a divorce is we need connection. Having connection is a huge part of our healing process. It makes that healing journey much faster, much easier. Yet connection can seem really out of reach because we're traumatized because we were just hurt in relationship. And now I'm saying go out and get a relationship. So here's a couple of things you can check for. If you know that you're feeling alone and you're scared of the loneliness of your future, but you're finding that it's hard to connect, check for a couple of things. First is to check for feeling. And this can show up in a lot of different ways. It can be sleeping too much, not sleeping enough. It can just be a sense that it's hard to go out 
right? It's hard to meet people. I'm saying connect. You're like, yeah, right. Where do I get the energy or the motivation to do that? So check for signs of depression or overwhelm because those are signals that your nervous system has been pushed out of balance all the way through fight or flight and into the start of a freeze state. And when our nervous system is there, it's a really common experience when we go through some trauma. And recognizing it, saying, okay, I see signs of overwhelm, signs of depression in myself. They're making it more difficult for me to get the kind of connection that would actually help me. That's really important information for you to have because it means your nervous system needs support in coming out of that freeze state and coming back to a more balanced place. A lot of different ways you can support it. Um, in past videos, I've talked about some breathing exercises that are really good for nervous system regulation. But honestly, if you're noticing signs of depression or overwhelm in yourself, the best thing you can do is get direct support. Work with a therapist, work with a counselor, work with a coach because it will be much easier to regulate your nervous system and come out of that free state to a more resourceful place where making real connections, real relationships becomes possible, where healing becomes easier. That will be much easier for you if you have the support of another person. And so if you're seeing signs of depression or overwhelm, please don't wait or rely just on friends or family or support groups or making additional connections that's a time to really reach out and get direct support. The other thing to look for if you're finding connection difficult is signs that your self-esteem or self-confidence have taken a hit by the divorce. Um, this is also really common. Right? There's a sense among a lot of the men that I work with that they're kind of asking the question, well, what's what was wrong with me? What's the flaw? What is it that made her decide she doesn't want to stay in this? to commit to me, what's wrong with me. And that can start us on this whole spiral that can become pretty destructive, where we really start to doubt who we are, our value in the world, our value as a partner, as a husband, as a provider, as a father. And when that self-confidence or self-esteem really takes a blow, it affects our ability to connect as well. Because if we don't feel like we're worthy or good enough, or we don't like ourselves very much, then we're not gonna expect somebody else to like us either. And we might find that it's really difficult to even imagine connecting with somebody, whether that's a new partner or just reaching out um, and making new friends, connecting to family, because if I don't like me and I don't wanna be around me, how can I expect somebody else to wanna be with me or wanna be my friend? And this is an area where we actually can do a lot of powerful work, you guys. Um, there are some exercises we can do to help you really get to know yourself on a deeper level, to have an understanding of your choices, your mistakes, the things that you regret, the things that you're ashamed of, in a way that will help you have compassion for yourself and start to rebuild that relationship with you. And when that self-relationship gets stronger, one, you have a great sense of connection right there. You're connected to you, to your healthy self, but it also makes it easier for you to reach out and connect with other people. It will make things like dating or finding a future partner much easier. Um, so those are the two big areas to check. If you're struggling with loneliness and especially with the sense that you're going to be alone or you don't know that you'll find somebody, I really would like you to check for signs of depression and overwhelm, which means you need some support with nervous system regulation. And check your self-image. What's the story your brain tells about you right now? Is it nice? Is it compassionate? Is it give you grace? Or is it pretty judgmental and critical? And these are the two areas that are so essential to work on. Um, and I know it's not really direct enough, right? I'm like, oh, you should go out and connect. And then I'm like, oh, but work on nervous system regulation and self. The thing is that those two things are the foundation. Being able to regulate your manage your emotions and like yourself from that foundation, building new relationships, especially new romantic relationships, getting out there and dating, connecting with somebody, finding um, the kind of partner that you really want in the world. Those things will become so much easier when you have that foundation of self-trust, a good relationship with yourself and the ability to manage and regulate difficult emotions. Um, guys, check in with me in the chat if you're on any questions, any thoughts, anything in particular you'd like me to speak to? Um, Jean-Claude, if you're still on with us, is there anything specific that you're struggling with right now um, being separated from your ex with BPD? Um, we can certainly go deeper into that if you'd like. 
Okay, guys. So the first thing I mentioned was to get connected, right? Get more support. And I want to offer you a couple of concrete ways to do it because it can be really overwhelming, right? Especially if you've been married for a long time, right? You have your routine. You might've found that a lot of your relationships were actually through, um, through your marriage that you guys had couples friends or a lot of your friends were her friends. And so in addition to just feeling, um, lonely and missing your partner, you might also find that you've kind of just been taken out of your familiar routine of the place that you're comfortable, the people that you know, the patterns, the day to day. And so let's talk about some things that you can do to actually um, start to connect and, and reach out to new people. So um, one of the big ones is to just start meeting and talking and connecting with everyone you encounter. Um, work can be a great place to make connections, but depending on what you do, it can be challenging. So I would really encourage you if you're going through this to become part of some new groups. There are great support groups out there, but it also doesn't have to be about divorce. And these connections can be about hobbies, things you like to do, Maybe you love hiking or yoga or motorcycles. In fact, maybe there's something that you really love that really lights you up that you gave up or really stopped focusing on during your marriage because it wasn't something that your wife was interested in. And this can be a really empowering time to renew those kinds of interests. And they can be such a powerful way to start to meet and connect with new people. The other big one is to make sure that you get that A-team lined out. So at the beginning of this call, I asked you to think of the people in your life. Is there somebody you can call? Somebody who would be there no matter what? Jean-Claude's mentioning his brother here in the chat. Uh, start to gather those people. Like the people in your life, whether it's friends, family, coworkers, and you know, it might even be a therapist or a coach or a counselor or a religious um, leader. Start gathering those people in your life. And if you are going through a separation or divorce, please tell them that this is hard. Tell them that you might need some support. It doesn't have to be today. You don't have to be asking that of them today. But put them on alert. Let them know that this is not easy, that this is a big deal, that the pain and the fear are real. Because when you tell them that, you're creating a safety net for yourself. You're like activating your A-team letting them know that you might reach out, you might need support. And now they know that when you call or text, they're going to be primed. They're going to answer, right? Even because you know how it is for the people that you would be there for. Sometimes you're busy. Sometimes you're stressed. Sometimes your kids are, right? there's so many things that come up in our lives that take us away, that make us silence a call or ignore a text until tomorrow. But if one of those people that you love came to you and said, hey, I'm going through some really hard things right now and I'm doing okay today, but I might reach out. And if I do, could you please um, try to be there for me? If somebody said that to you, somebody that you loved, and then they called you two weeks later, you would answer the phone. So support yourself. Give the people you love a heads up that you might need their support. And then don't hesitate to use it. And I, I want to say this for the men that are watching, especially, because so many of you have always had to be the ones that were there for everyone else, right? The ones who didn't show weakness, the ones who were the rock. And so I just want to say this for you to really hear it. When you allow the people you love to support you, it is a gift to them. It's not just you that benefits from that. They benefit from having the opportunity to give you love and support. And if you doubt this, I want you to think about yourself, your own identity as a provider, as a caregiver, as a father, as a husband, how good does it feel to you when you have the opportunity to support the people you love, when they come to you and ask for your help, whether that's financial or emotional or to solve a problem, and it makes you feel needed, it makes you feel loved, it makes you feel connected to them. So you're going through something that is really hard right now. You need support because you are human, not because you are weak, because you are a human being who is going through something difficult. And every human nervous system needs support when that happens. So please give the people your love, your, that you love the opportunity to connect with you in that way. 
might be really uncomfortable, especially if you're used to being the one who supports them. Um, but there's so much room here for you to grow and for them to grow and for that relationship to get deeper and richer because you are offering them the opportunity to play a different role in it. Um, Steve, I want to speak to what you said because I I hear this a lot, I'm afraid, um, here on YouTube with my clients. I lost everyone. She took them with her. Yeah, this can be a really scary place to find yourself um, that a lot of friends or family have gone. Um, I've worked with a few men who didn't have very good family histories themselves, had a lot of trauma or a lot of loss, and her family really was a sanctuary for them. And so then to be disconnected from those people, right? You're not just losing your spouse, you're also losing the community and the family that came along with her. Um, so Steve, a couple of things for you. Um, I would strongly, strongly encourage you and anyone else who's in this position of feeling really without anyone. First thing to do, reach out and start working with a therapist, a counselor, a coach, a pastor, get somebody who is, um, professionally in the field in some way or another, enlist the support of that person. You can pay for counseling or therapy. You most, well, I shouldn't say most, a lot of employers um, have some tools in place to help you do that. And at the very least, Steve, there are also some hotlines that are a starting point. So I would encourage you on like today, if not yesterday, start there enlist some professional help and some professional support because that person, what they can do is start to give you a mirror for your nervous system, help you start to process and regulate what you're feeling. And it's so important that we have a safe space to do that. And it's so important that we have help to do that. And then Steve, from there, I would encourage you to slowly start to branch out. So look for communities and support groups um, you're welcome to join me. I have a program called Better Beyond Divorce, and it's got a monthly membership option that has an incredible community of really amazing guys. Um, even here on YouTube, there are some amazing communities um, of men and of men and women who are going through something similar. You can also find, depending on where you live, um, support groups and grief groups. It doesn't even have to be about divorce. I would encourage you, so in this order, Steve, first, some professional support a coach, a therapist, a pastor, a counselor, somebody like that. Second, a support group of some sort. I don't care if it's just a Facebook group. Somewhere where there is a culture of compassion and support and healing. Um, and then the third level is to get some support that's just not got anything to do with this divorce, right? To start connecting with people in your life. So again, work is a great place to start to make these connections, which you can do just by becoming more curious about the people that you interact with every day. Um, but you can also join some new groups, get on Meetup, whatever your passion, your hobby, things that you like to do or that you used to like to do, uh, you know, join a hiking group, a biking group, um, start training for a triathlon, like whatever it is that you are into, find a group of people who are doing that and start to engage with them. And if you feel like that's challenging or daunting, or your brain is like, are you kidding me? There's no way in heck I am about to get up and do that right now. Then please check back with these two things I mentioned. Check yourself for signs of depression and overwhelm. If you find them, then please bring that to the therapist, the counselor, the coach that you talk to, and let them help you regulate your nervous system. And two is check your self-image. What is the story you're telling about yourself? How is your self-confidence, your self-esteem? Because you might need to do some work on how you see yourself and the compassion and self-respect that you bring to your relationship with you. Those are some hurdles that you might need to overcome, some areas where you might need to grow for yourself in order to feel really comfortable going out and starting to expand the circle of people in your life. Um, let's see, Jordo is on. It's really good to have you here. Um, I have friends that I go to for sure. Hard to, in my mind, to let others be close to me. Yeah. Yeah. This is huge to acknowledge to you guys. What I'm asking you to do is not easy, right? I'm like, gather the people around you, love you and ask them for help. That's hard. Right? It's especially hard for men, but it's hard in general. And it's really hard in our society where I think we learn we're supposed to be so independent and strong and have it together. And everyone's on social media, like showing how they have it all together. Um, so again, it is a gift to other people to ask them for your, 
for help. And in addition to allowing them to be in that supportive role and deepen your relationship, it also gives them permission to not be okay around you. And every time you admit that it's hard for you, that you're not doing so hot today, it makes those people feel like their pain, their struggle is validated. Um, and yes, Jordo says also have counseling in this cool divorce support group monthly. Jordo is in um, Better Beyond Divorce and part of that community. And they are, it really is an incredible group of guys on there. Um, let's see, David's in the chat. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Yeah. I caught my wife cheating with her coworker on her birthday. His wife sent me a video of them. Oh my gosh, David. Um, she and him are now fully together. I'm alone. Yeah. Um, David, what I can tell you is that you are not alone in go the fact that you're going through the hardest thing you've ever had to do. Um, you might've heard me say this before, but I've had a number of men that I've worked with who have been to war, who have been in Iraq, who've been in Afghanistan, who've seen and done horrible, traumatic, awful things. Consistently, they tell me that the divorce is the hardest thing they've ever had to do. Um, what I do know though, David, is that you can do hard things. You are a man in this society and you have made it this far. You've had to do hard things and you can do this too. Um, but it's really important to know that you do not have to do it alone. Um, I'm going to drop it here, guys. It's at the top of the chat, but this is the link to um, my free app. There's some good resources on there and some starting places. Um, whether it's with me or with somebody else, I would encourage everyone on this call, anyone who watches this, gather support, work with a therapist, work with a coach, join a community. It makes a massive difference and it has nothing to do with strength or your value or your worth or if you're weak. It is just about how the human nervous system heals, how the human nervous system regulates emotions. And the human nervous system just does better when we feel connected to other people. Um, let's see, David's got some more info here. The hardest is getting my daughter half the time. She told me I was too distant. It's because I finally got help with PTSD. I've been through seven deployments. Um, yeah, so you know exactly what I'm talking about, David, when I say that men tell me that divorce is far harder than going to war. Um, so David, you don't have to share this on here, but um, if we were to sit down and just have this talk one-on-one, -on -one, I would definitely ask you, what kind of support and treatment you're pursuing right now. And I would encourage you to really continue um, getting help with the PTSD. And I would also just prepare you to, to recognize, and maybe you already experienced this, that what you're going through right now is likely to bring up and trigger a lot of that, that past pain as well. Um, awesome. So David says he's got two counselors and a psychiatrist. That's Wonderful, David. I'm glad that you're um, seeking and using that support. And I'm really glad that you're here getting additional support too. Um, yeah, so this is what happens. And this is not just true for people that have PTSD or who have um, been deployed. This is for almost every single client I've ever worked with. The divorce is just the catalyst. Yes, the divorce sucks. It's hard. Um, it's painful, but it brings up everything that's under the surface and everything that's really ever been under the surface. So if there's childhood trauma, or maybe there's not even big childhood trauma, maybe it's just your parents got divorced or um, your mom was a little bit emotionally distant and didn't give you many hugs, or maybe you had a hard time in school. Right? Any moments from childhood or throughout our life growing up or something um, like what you must have experienced, David, being deployed seven times, any, any trauma, any place in our life where there was a relational injury, whether that was with another person where we felt um, betrayed or we had a loss or we felt rejected or abandoned or with ourself, right? We can have relational trauma with ourselves where something happens that makes us doubt ourselves, question ourselves, not like ourselves. Um, any kind of past relational trauma that we've had with other people or internally is going to be brought up by this divorce. And what that does is it just intensifies what you're already feeling. And if I know not everyone was with me on the start of this call, one of the things we were talking about is that 
in the be, you know, in the beginning of this call, we talked about how primal and intense that fear of being alone and the feeling of being rejected or abandoned is. So already this experience has a strong primal like life and death feeling to it just because of how humans evolved and how we evolved to be reliant on our relationships for survival. So we already have this incredibly intense emotion, but now it's also triggering every other moment in our lives where we felt rejected, abandoned, betrayed, unworthy, unlovable, um, left. And so you can imagine how quickly all of that starts to add up and spiral and it can become really overwhelming, which is why it's really important that we take care of the nervous system. And I talk about the nervous system a lot and maybe this is a moment to, um, to just kind of split the, the definition up a little bit. There's what happens in the nervous system and then there's our emotions. So our emotions are our grief, our sadness, our fear, our joy, our excitement. But then the nervous system reacts to what we're feeling. And that's where so much of this added intensity comes from because we feel all of the pain and the fear. And then that triggers everything that's ever happened to us. And so that feels really bad. And then the nervous system goes, holy smokes, I can't handle this. It's too much pain. And we start to panic and we go into fight or flight. And so that adds another layer. And so that's why I keep talking about nervous system regulation. Because when we can calm the nervous system out of fight or flight and come into a balanced state, it becomes more manageable. It doesn't mean grief goes away or anger or fear goes away. It just gives us some room so that I can sit here and breathe and be calm and start to feel these things and work my way through them. And in that space, I also start to get some of my prefrontal cortex back. Because when we go into fight or flight, we lose a lot of access to our conscious higher level thinking. So if I can calm my nervous system, I can also start to tease these things apart. And I can say, okay, here's the pain of my separation and divorce. And this is really hard and I need to work with this. And here's the pain that's coming from the PTSD, right? Here's the pain from one of the things that happened when I was deployed. Here's the pain from that childhood experience of rejection or loss. And so when we can start to see all of these things, that can now add to the calming of the nervous system because we can say, okay, I can see where all this is coming from. And now I can start to process each of those things differently. And in that space, we can also start to remember that even though there's all of this and it's painful and it's hard, and it's scary. I right now am here. I'm in the space for you guys right now. You're watching this video. You're okay, right? You're not in danger in this moment. And that helps bring the nervous system down another notch. And so I hope you see how it can start to make these emotions more manageable and give us room to work through and do the healing we need to do. Okay, guys, I'm going to check back in with the chat. Jay Ingle, I joined BBD today. Awesome. Um, so good to have you, Jay. Welcome to the community. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have you there. Um, so guys, those of you who don't know, um, in addition to this YouTube channel, I also run um, an online membership. It's called the Better Beyond Divorce Community. It's got a whole series of courses that walks you through the best ways that I know to regulate your nervous system, rebuild self-confidence, and start to work through everything that's happened so that you can eventually shift your focus forward um, and start to really rebuild your life. Or rebuild is maybe not the right word because it's building your future, right? which may be very different than what your past was. And honestly, it can be a lot better which I know can be really hard to believe right now. Um, and so Jay just joined that community and I'm really excited to have you there. Um, been white knuckling, riding the ups and downs for eight months. Yeah, Jay, it can be like a roller coaster, right? Um, and sometimes it feels like you're just kind of holding on for dear life. So what we are gonna do here in these first couple of weeks um, in Better Beyond Divorce is help you smooth out some of those ups and downs um, so that you feel like you've got you may be a good metaphor. I have a client who talks about it feeling like he's in a boat on a really rough, stormy sea. And he said for a long time, he felt like he was just like clinging to that boat and getting just tossed around and there was nothing he could do. And he was just trying to stay alive. Um, and as he did this work, as he learned to regulate his nervous system, manage his mind, look at his self-confidence, all of this stuff that we, we do in Better Beyond Divorce, he said it started to feel like now the boat had a really steady keel. So he's still on those rough seas, but now the boat keeps riding itself and it's not getting tossed back and forth as far. And then as he continued to do the work, 
it's actually, I loved his metaphor. He said, you know, now it's like there's a crew on the boat and we're actually, even though the seas are still rough, we're kind of managing the sails and there's a rudder and I can even start to steer the ship in the direction that I want to go. Right. So I still have to weather this storm, but now I've got the steadiness of a solid keel. My ship feels really whole and strong and I'm starting to be able to steer it. Um, so Jay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to turn this, this roller coaster into something that you have some more, uh, more say and more direction around. Um, okay. A couple more things in the chat, David, this is definitely true. I did a mal metabolic test when it first happened and I was burning 2,100 calories per day, just resting. Wow. That's a really interesting thing to check, David. Um, yeah, that's fight or flight. Your body is running at like top speed because it's trying to keep you alive. And a really powerful, powerful thing can be really to just sit in the moment and notice that you're breathing, that you're safe right here, right now. It doesn't make all of this go away, but we have to teach the limbic system. We have to teach the nervous system that we don't need to run away from a lion right now, that we're okay here, that we're doing the things that we need to do because those part of it's that primal response of feeling abandoned, feeling left. Um, and part of it is that it's triggering, right? All of the PTSD, all of the other traumas in your life. And as we can start to recognize and tease that apart, we can help the nervous system start to say, okay, yeah, there's some stuff to deal with, but I'm okay here and I'm here now and we're working on it. Um, let's see, there's another comment here, super unknown. I feel jealous. She still texts me. She loves me, but goes on vacation with a new boyfriend. What the fuck? Yeah, um, I hear you. Unfortunately, you're not alone in this either. Um, one person in particular comes to mind whose ex will tell him, well, she'll come over for wild sex and then tell him how she hates his guts as soon as they're done. Um, this can be an incredibly difficult thing, especially if there were unhealthy patterns, unhealthy cycles, toxic relationships, although I hate that word. Um, if there was abuse of any kind, emotional, mental, physical in that relationship, these cycles can be even harder to break. Um, and so what I would tell you super unknown is that I would really encourage you to set some boundaries for yourself um, because it might be that she's in a place where those things are true that she does love you and she's going on vacation with her boyfriend. The human brain has no problem holding completely contradictory beliefs at the same time and believing that both are equally true, but that doesn't mean that it's okay for you. Um, and so I think part of your journey is going to be the incredibly difficult decision um, to respect and value and honor yourself more than she is able to. And as you step into that space, um, I hope for you that the awareness will start to be that I deserve to be treated better than this. Um, I deserve to be loved in a less hurtful way than this. Um, so much of what happens for a lot of us, especially if we have challenges in our childhood, is that we can learn that love and pain are connected and that love and rejection are connected, that they go hand in hand. Um, this happens a lot if you've got parents who just weren't able to be really emotionally present for you. Uh, that you learn that love and being pushed away all kind of happen at once. And so it might even feel kind of familiar, right? That she texts you like this and then goes off with somebody else. And so that can be an opportunity, believe it or not, um, to understand yourself better, to explore your patterns, to start to explore the question of why is it that I am so attracted to a person who treats me like this? because that's not a judgment, it's a genuinely curious question. What has been your experience that makes this feel familiar to you? What is it that you learned to believe about love and acceptance that made it be tied to rejection? And is that a pattern that you wanna keep? Or is it one that you wanna explore and understand and start to let go? Um, checking in with David again. My last deployment was the Afghanistan evacuation. I caught TB and did INH pills. Destroyed my body and I ballooned at 215 pounds. Two weeks after. Wow. David, that's huge. Um, I want to just celebrate you for a moment, David, for getting the support that you've gotten. Um, 
it's not easy to do, especially when you've been through things like you have. Reaching out, working with counselors, working with a psychiatrist, that's huge. Um, and I just, I want to celebrate that you've done that, that you've seen the importance of it and that you're valuing yourself highly enough to get that support and that care. And I would just encourage you to keep going. The human brain, the human body just astounds me with how resilient it is, with its ability to heal, to rebalance, to recover, to change patterns. Um, there's so, so, so much um, that our brains are capable of. And it sounds like you are you are on this journey and you are doing this work. Um, and I would just strongly encourage you to give you um, give yourself some grace. I appreciate it, but even right now, it feels like it's not working. My days are great when I have Haley, but weekends like this, it's just hard to keep moving on. That's why I browse this channel. Um, well, I'm glad, David, that you, you did, and I hope that this helps a little bit. Um, you know, if we were sitting down in a coaching conversation, I would ask you what what happens internally when you have Haley? What kinds of things do you think? What kinds of things do you feel? And see if you can really start to create almost a map or a model of who you are on the inside when you're with her, what you believe in those moments. Yeah, I'm so damn happy. We have so much fun. Um, yeah. So, okay, David, I'm going to, we'll go into this, um, Oh, my six-year-old angel is my everything. That's awesome. Um, how do you think about yourself in those moments, David? Um, because what I would really encourage you to start paying attention to is the relationship between where your attention is focused and how you feel. So where we focus our thoughts has a direct and often powerful impact on what we feel. And right now, when you're having a hard time moving on, I bet you're brain is focused on some pretty painful thoughts, some pretty overwhelming thoughts. But when you're with her, right, when you're with Haley, you are focused on her. And I would get even more specific than that. Like, what are your thoughts in that moment about who you are, what's possible for you, what's possible for her? Um, I imagine that there's probably feelings of gratitude and pride and excitement and all kinds of energy this is something that you could break down um, with one of your counselors, or if you want to reach out to me, um, I'm just going to drop my email here in the chat. Um, you're welcome to, to write me and we can talk about ways of exploring it together. Um, but I would encourage you to really start to break down and get curious. What are those belief systems? Where is your energy focused? Where is your attention focused? How does that impact the way you feel? Um, we are still technically married and I take my vows extremely seriously for Haley. She's so smart. I can't believe I was lucky enough to have her as a daughter. Yeah. Um, and this is, there's a lot of challenges here, right, David? Um, just that thing, taking your vows seriously can be such a powerful part of your belief system, who you are. Maybe it's even part of a religious belief system, um, but then it also makes what you're going through right now so much more devastating. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of beliefs, a lot of thought patterns here that we can start to explore. Um, the last thing I'd, I'd offer to you today, David, is that a little distraction is okay too. You're doing the work, right? You're working with the counselors, you're working with the psychiatrist. You're, I'm sure, you're exploring a lot of these things more than you really want to. A little distraction is okay too, right? Um, and this is where that third level of connection that we talked about earlier can come in really handy. So um, on this call, we talked about finding connection both with professional support, right? Coaches, therapists, counselors, pastors, um, with people who can understand and relate to what you're going through. So support groups, um, communities of people who are either going through separation or divorce or other kinds of loss. Um, PTSD would be another area where you could search for um for support other, other veterans who are going through similar things. But then there's the third group, which is people who are not connected to you because of your pain, but instead they're connected to you because of your passions. And that's where finding something you genuinely enjoy, woodworking, mountain biking, skiing, um, gardening, right? For me, it's a lot of outdoors stuff. It could be something very different for you. It could be some form of art or music or anything that you genuinely enjoy, that brings you pleasure. Create a third group 
for yourself. Start to find and connect with people who share some of your passions because that is going to be a place where you can find really healthy forms of distraction, right? We want to make sure that we do the work on the pain, that we don't ignore it or stifle it, that we process the emotions, but we also need a break. We also need rest. We also need places to recharge and re-energize. And sometimes we just need to give ourselves grace and say, it's too damn hard to think about this right now. I want to do something fun. Maybe it's some movies that you love, but find a community of people who are totally into those movies too. Right? Find the thing that you enjoy that gives you pleasure and then connect with people who also share that interest. And that is going to be such a source of, of energy, of motivation, of support, and just of, of rest maybe more than anything. All right, guys, I really appreciate you all being on with me today. Um, we're going to head towards wrapping up, but I just want to give you a moment in the chat there. If there are any burning questions, comments, something that you'd really like me to speak to before we wrap up today, please let me know. Um, David, you are welcome. Thank you so much for being here um, and for sharing some of your story with us. Okay, guys, so you are always welcome to hop onto the community section on my channel and um, leave me a note. If there's something you'd like to see a video about, a conversation that you'd like to have, please reach out. Um, my email is in the chat, as is the link to my free Better Beyond Divorce app. So if you're looking for additional resources, please feel free to email me directly or download the app and explore that. Um, and I hope to see you guys here on a next video soon. Okay. I hope everyone has a good Labor Day weekend and I'll see you guys shortly.